In fact, uh, vineyards are a $40 billion a year industry. More than 267 million cases of wine, which is in excess of over 800 million gallons are drunk here in the United States. It's incredible to think about the popularity of wine. In fact, in California, wineries are second only to one other tourist attraction, Disneyland. It's incredible, but the vines are very valuable. But they're not only valuable financially, but I want to have you consider they're valuable spiritually. But before we talk about the connection of vines and how we are to be connected to that true vine, I want to share with you how often we feel as people on this planet by way of a story. It's a true story of a mom with four small children all under the age of five. And she decided she had to get supplies for her three-year-old's birthday party. So she grabbed all of them, and one of them happened to be an infant. So she had the three little kiddos off on the side, and then uh, she had the infant in the front part where she was pushing the cart. She had to watch them to make sure they didn't wander off. And she was with them all throughout the store, getting the balloons, the streamers, the candy, and the ingredients for the cake that she would bake a little bit later that day. She got into the line and finally could feel crossing over the finish line of getting this task done. When she went through, she put the kiddos in their seats, and she was driving away. And as she was driving away, her three-year-old child said, Mom, where's the baby? And mom realized she left the baby in the shopping cart uh, in all the flurry of activity. She turned around, got back to parking, and when she arrived, there was already a police officer asking questions of the people around and was right near the baby. And it's interesting because we might ask questions, and some of the questions of people when they hear a story like that is, what kind of parent is that? And others of you might be more gracious and think, well, I could understand. you got four small kids. It's an overwhelming situation. But sometimes we ask that. What kind of parent is God? If he really loves us, why does he leave us on this earth and doesn't take us right away to heaven? Why does he have us still stay here? And part of that answer is connected to the concept of the vine, that the vine produces something. The vine is absolutely essential because the vine helps us to understand what life is all about, that we have a plan and a purpose. And part of that plan and purpose is that we would bear fruit as Christians. Today, we're going to talk about the seventh and final I am statement in our series. And it's going to be the statement that Jesus is the true vine. So if you haven't already done so, take out your notes, and we're going to turn our attention to John chapter 15. We'll begin by looking at verses 1 and 2, starting at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. What's he saying? Uh, The context of the passage is that he has been in the upper room with the disciples. He has gone and celebrated the Lord's Supper with them, which is that new continuation and expansion of the Passover celebration. But now what's happened, he's about to prepare going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he goes there, he's actually surrounded with vines and Even to this day, if you were to go to the Holy Land, you would see just that, that this place is filled with all these vines. And it's important that there's production from those vines. And in the passage, there is a phrase that's used over and over again. So I just want to highlight that in verse 2. It says this, that every branch that does not bear fruit that he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse 4 that he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, 
in the latter part of that verse, it says, whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he who bears much fruit. Uh, verse 8, by this time my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Finally, verse 16, it says it this way, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. What are the two words that you see repeated over and over in this passage? Boy, that was sad. Let's try that one more time. Bear fruit. So it's a key idea in this passage. That's what we're to do. And in this section of Scripture, the key players are identified. God the gardener, Jesus the vine, and we the branches or the twigs. It's key that we understand some notions before we dive into our passage. First, that this is the true vine, which of course implies what? That there is a false vine. Sometimes people try to turn to these false vines rather than the true and living vine. Second, one of the things that we need to understand is apart from me, this is Jesus speaking, you can do nothing. We pass by that all too quickly. We've got to understand that when it comes to our salvation, there's absolutely nothing we do to save ourselves. As far as sanctification, we can't even do that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit transforming our lives. Third, that when we abide, we find that there's fruit production, that that comes. Here's another key idea, and this is something that we'll talk about in a few minutes, is that in order to produce fruit in the life of a believer, there has to be, according to the gardener, some pruning. And I want to talk to you just briefly in a few moments about that, but pruning is part of the Christian life. If you're going to grow and mature in your faith, there's going to be some kind of pruning. And we'll talk about that in a few moments as well. And then finally, I want you to keep this key idea in your mind. It's the key takeaway. When you're connected to the root, that's Jesus, you will bear fruit. You don't do that so that God will love you and accept you, but God has already loved and accepted you through Jesus and his work at the cross. And we as believers, because we're connected to him, produce, if you will, or rather bear fruit. So with that said, let's uh, take out your sermon notes and we're going to take a look at three observations this morning. God empowers us to connect to Christ personally. God empowers us to connect to Christ personally. Uh, turn your attention to verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Did you catch that idea that Christians are what? Connected to Christ. You've probably heard the statement, it's not what you know, but who you know. Basically, it means that if you have the right connections, you can go pretty much anywhere, get a job or a career opportunity, or perhaps even get into the school that you're hoping to, as long as you have those right connections. But I want you to consider that the Christian has the right connection, Jesus. No other world religion has the same kind of concept of how we are connected to the founder. Think about it with me for just a moment or two. When you consider the average Buddhist, they don't have this great connection with Buddha. When you talk about a Confucianist, they're not so excited about their close walk with Confucius every single day. When you even consider a committed Muslim, he's not all that concerned about, quite frankly, his closeness to Muhammad. But when you talk about the Christian, we have a connection to the founder, Jesus Christ. But it's not just an organizational connection but it's an organic connection. What do I mean by that? That we have this connection to God that is living. It's not simply about a structure, but that it's a living, breathing organism. But you don't always see those connections everywhere. There's a beautiful campus in Florida, and on this campus, it's a university, they have all these hundreds of year old oak trees. And on these oak trees, there's something called Spanish moss. Anybody know what Spanish moss is? Okay, a few of you. The Spanish moss is not connected 
to the trees. And so people around the campus will typically, oftentimes, lift their hands up and just pull the moss off. Why? Because it's not connected. And here's the truth of the matter is that sometimes people can be a part of religious organizations and not be connected to Christ. They can go through the motions of doing activities, but may not understand the truth of who Jesus is. My old youth pastor used to say it this way, going to church doesn't make you a Christian as much as going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. I think there's a lot of truth to that. We need to be connected to Jesus. But notice back to verse 5, what it says. For apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. There are things that we can do. We can have a money-making ventures. We can uh, keep a job. We can raise our family. But here's the thing. You can't be a Christian apart from Christ. You can't, and neither can I. Years ago, I was a young adult pastor, so I worked with young adults, and it was just a, a great opportunity because they're filled with so much energy and excitement. They're willing to change, and they can drive themselves around. And so uh, there is a lot of real blessings to doing that ministry. I, I spent years as a youth pastor, and they never had cars. That's why I say that. And what's interesting is a couple young men said to me, you know, pastor, living the Christian life is hard. And I said, I totally disagree with you. I said, it's impossible apart from Jesus. I can't do this on my own. Only God connected to him can I live the Christian life. Let's look at the second observation, and that is God empowers me to concentrate on Christ. In other words, to truly think upon Jesus. Uh, turn your attention back to verse 4. It says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Uh, there is this focus that we need to have on Christ. The author of Proverbs puts it this way, that as a man thinketh, so is he. What does that mean? Basically, what you think upon is what you become. In the New Testament, Jesus says, think of things above, not things below. In other words, don't think simply of the things on this earth, but have a heavenly perspective. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says it this way. He says, and I quote, have this mind which was in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. Do you see how we are to focus our thoughts on Jesus. In the book of Philippians, Paul also says, fix your thoughts on Christ. But now let's come back to the metaphor that's given to us in this passage. Fruit is to reflect the character of either the tree or the vine. So if you have an orange tree, what do you hope to have on that tree? A pears? Uh, let's say a uh, grapevine. What do you want? God wants us to bear fruit in our lives. So let's take a look at what he says about that in verses 2 and following. He says that a branch that doesn't bear any fruit that he takes away, we'll say more about that in a few moments, he then talks about a branch that produces some fruit and that he prunes that branch. Then he talks about a branch that bears even more fruit. And then in verse 5, he says that we are to bear much fruit. And then finally, he says, to bear the best fruit. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. That's lasting fruit that won't rot. But let's go back just quickly to verse 2, where we read these words. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. The word take away can either be translated to pick up or lift up. This is so fascinating. So here we see the viticulturist or the gardener's perspective or how God will often work. So these vines, they can't be on the ground. They have to be lifted up. Squash and pumpkin can be on the ground and they're okay. Second, you can't have dirt and all sorts of stuff on top of your vines. You've got to keep them clean. And then finally, the vines have to be exposed to the sun. 
think about it, how God does the work in our lives, that he lifts us up, he cleans us, he brings us to the Son. Do you see the beautiful depiction? That's the work of God the Father developing character. But there's a second aspect, and this is where I really want to camp out for a moment or two, and it's this, found in the next section of Scripture where he talks about it in verse 2, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. This is a tough teaching of Scripture, but I think it's really important that you and I understand what this pruning is. When there's pruning, there's really one word that comes to my mind, ouch, it hurts to prune in our own lives. And he's talking about the pruning of this twig or this branch that's rather insignificant. Remember, that's representative of you and I. And then he goes on to say this, that we have to prune to bear fruit. In order for our lives to be reflective of Jesus, pruning is part of the experience. So let's talk about that. This could be heartache, difficulty, loss of a job, a physical ailment that God allows that helps us to get closer to Jesus. God takes your crisis, he takes your suffering, he takes the difficulties, and he draws us closer to Jesus Christ. Now, how does he prune? Let me give you three ways. You might want to write these down. The first way that he prunes is through the Scripture. The second way that he prunes is through suffering. And the third way, believe it or not, is through our stupid choices. God sometimes will do his pruning work when we do that. So let's take a look at each of these. The first way that God prunes is through the Bible. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Did you hear that? The word of God was spoken, and it began to change this individual. When you read the Bible, sometimes it's comforting, right? But other times, it's convicting, and it challenges us. And if we're going to be honest, we don't always like that. The author of the book of Hebrews says this about the Bible, that it is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. But one of my favorite translations of that passage reads as follows. It's sharper than the sharpest knife that cuts into our inmost thoughts and desires, and it exposes us for what we really are. The Bible has the ability to show you who you truly are, to show you your motives, your attitudes, your selfishness, and you're shocked by it, but you shouldn't be. That's part of pruning. There's a second aspect, and that has to do with suffering. So when we suffer, God cuts away our sinful desires and habits in our lives. This is so key for you to understand. We learn more in pain than we do in pleasure. So listen carefully to the words of C.S. Lewis. I think he said it so aptly. He wrote, and I quote, that pain plants the flag of truth in the fortress of a rebel heart. Chew on that for a moment. Let me read it one more time. Pain plants the flag of truth, that's the Bible, in the fortress of the rebel or the sinner's heart. David stated it this way in Psalm 119. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So do you see how suffering can prune away certain things? And interesting aside, when there is pruning, there's two truths I want you to consider. Number one, when we cut away those dead branches, we can see the vine more clearly. God is more seen clearly than before. And then secondly, the hand of the one who's doing the pruning is never closer than when he's pruning. It's in the suffering of your life and my life that God is showing us, wow, I am near you. I have not forsaken you. And the third way is stupidity. You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my own. Anybody ever make a stupid choice? I think, all right, there's three honest people and the rest of you are liars, but that's okay. God loves you anyway and has a plan for your life. I remember when I was a little kid, one of the things that I did was that I loved forks, in particular metal forks. And my favorite activity with the metal fork was to stick it in electrical outlets. My mom was not happy with this. 
She said, you will electrocute yourself. You could cause damage. And I ignored my mom's decision to protect me. So one day, I had my little metal fork. I ran, and I shoved it right in there, and I hit some wire. I still don't know what it was. Electricity came through my hand, up through my elbow, through to my shoulder, and part of my body, and my arm was shaking uncontrollably for probably a good 15 minutes because I shocked myself. And when my mom found out, she decided, hey, I'm going to swat his rear so he doesn't do that again. Now, some of you might say, wow, what a mean parent. How unloving and uncaring. Don't they understand uh, that physical things shouldn't happen like that? But what was her heart's intention? To protect me, to help me. What is God's intention? Even when you do something so stupid that the proverbial light switch or the outlet, and you're shoving the fork in there, He's wanting to even use that to draw you closer to Jesus. And so I think this is a key concept that we've got to understand. Romans 8.28 put it this way. For we know that in all things God is working together for good those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Isn't that a beautiful image? So first, God empowers us to be connected to Christ Second, we see that he empowers us to concentrate on Christ. And then thirdly, we see that God empowers us to continue in Christ daily. Turn your attention to verse 4 one more time. It's the only imperative that's based on you, not on God, in this whole section of Scripture. Verse 4 says, abide in me. The word abide means to remain or continue. Stop there for a second. What's going on here? You don't manufacture the fruit. You don't produce the fruit. You don't go and create or manipulate the fruit. God produces it, but you abide. So back in verse 4, 5, 7, 9, and 10, he says seven times we're to abide. Did you get that picture? So the question then I want to ask you is, how do we abide in Jesus Christ? So let me share with you just a couple quick ideas, because I know our time is limited, so I'll kind of congest those ideas together. First and foremost, it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. That's where we need to be connected to Jesus. Anybody here ever go and do a cup of tea You remember, you take the tea bag, you put it in the hot water, and before too long, what happens to the hot water? It starts to change color. It has the flavor of the tea bag. And this is what I want to encourage you, is the more you are seeping in the Word of God, that you begin to notice that that Word has a way of impacting you. It just seeps into your life. So coming together when we gather for worship, coming together in a Bible study, coming together in a daily devotional time with the portals of prayer, or maybe you sign up for the EDIBs, electronic daily individual Bible studies, these are ways to do it. Second, God helps us to abide through the sacraments. Uh, Today we partook of the Lord's Supper, and God is reaching out to us in the Lord's Supper. He gives us his grace and mercy and strength in that meal. And of course, in baptism so that he marks us as his children. But I want to just mention also not just these means of grace, but I want to give you three spiritual disciplines that I think will help you in your walk with Jesus. So the first one is pray. What is prayer? It's communication with God. It's listening to God and speaking to him. But it's also an opportunity for us to really be changed and transformed because In the next couple of weeks, when we begin our vertical series talking about prayer, we'll learn some practical ways we can grow in prayer and how to better abide with Jesus. Second, we need other Christians. This is so important. I really want you to track with me. Do not live the Christian life on your own. You are not intended to be a lone ranger. Even the lone ranger had Tonto. You know, so uh, it's important to realize we need each other. Do not forsake the gathering or assembly of believers. Third and finally, this is a spiritual discipline, but it's so simple. It's living a life of service for others. When we begin to serve in the church and outside of the church, when we serve people in need, there's something that happens in our hearts. 
I can't quantify it. I can't fully explain it, but I just know that it changes us. So we've been in this series for seven or so weeks. In this series, we've been looking at who Jesus is. At the end of the series, I want you to understand who Christ truly is. He is that bread of life. The world will try to satisfy you, but it will leave you hungry every single time. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ can truly satisfy that need for significance, for satisfaction in life, for security, because it only comes from him. It doesn't come from you. We also saw in the scriptures how Jesus is the light of the world. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever experienced the darkness of this world? Well, guess what? You need the light. Jesus is that light. And what's interesting about light is it exposes things, so that's part of light, but it also gives us the ability to be free from certain things. So when we are in our darkest moments, Jesus is at his brightest. When we look at John chapter 10, what we saw were two beautiful I am statements. The first one is that Jesus is the gate or the door. But remember we talked about how this was for the sheep pen, and there was one that was in the community, but there was one that was farther away from the community, and it's the one that was farther away. They would have the small walls around. They would, on top of that, have like uh, little uh, barbs on the top to keep them, but that gate area was actually the shepherd that was sleeping right there, and that nobody could go in or out unless the shepherd literally was making sure they were okay. And not only that, but that shepherd would lay down his life in protection of the sheep. And then we looked at that beautiful image that Jesus is the good shepherd, that he's not just a shepherd, but he's the shepherd. He's the supreme shepherd who loves you, cares for you, guides and directs you in your life. And when you begin to understand that, that changes everything because you know that he is not a hireling, but he's the good shepherd who literally went to the cross for you. In John chapter 11, we saw that beautiful story of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It's one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. And we saw how he waits and how sometimes waiting is a part of our lives. But we also learned this, that Jesus was the what? The resurrection and the life. Some of you have faced death of a loved one. Maybe you're facing fears in your own life. And what Jesus is telling us through this series is that he brings life even when there is death. Even when we have uncertainty, we have the certainty of heaven because of Jesus preparing a place for us. And he gives us resurrection life. In John chapter 14, remember that passage? We talked about how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father except through the Son. There's not a lot of roads to God. There's one. His name is Jesus He is the path of salvation. There are not many paths. And then finally, today we talked about Jesus being the true vine. What are you connecting yourself to? Are you connected to Jesus? Are you close to him? Are some of you going through a pruning season in your life where it's so painful Maybe God is using the scriptures. Maybe he's using suffering. Perhaps he's using some of your own stupid decisions. And he says, come to me. I want you to reflect him well. Friends, you have the true vine. Stay connected to him. Concentrate on him. Continue in him daily. And as you do, listen carefully, you will bear fruit in your lives. And it will impact the lives of others. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I